Well, Sprocket, that was extremely problematic. I don't think I'm going to show this in the video. Oh, you think I should? Yeah, you're right. This is the kind of stuff that people appreciate about my channel. Okay. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on the Vertical Fire 2 boiler today, and I need to make the firebox. That's the box that holds the fire. I'm not sure why they call it that, but it sits under the boiler, and it's a box that holds the fire. And we need one on my boiler, so let's go. Here's the firebox so far. It might look mostly complete, and well it is, because if you've been watching this series, you know that I cut this off of a previously failed attempt at this boiler. So I need to get it sitting on the new boiler shell thusly. That will live on there semi-permanently, and then the chimney comes off for lighting the flue from above, which is typically how this is done with vertical model boilers. This was bandsaw cut off the previous boiler, and I did my best to get it straight, but, you know, it's not very straight. So I need to straighten it up first of all, so I'll chuck it up in the three jaw and face this down. This is a very straightforward machining operation that will have no problems, so sit back and relax and enjoy a little bit of chip making where definitely nothing will go wrong. Well. That all went extremely pear-shaped. Literally, look at that. This thing is trashed. I can hear the furious typing from here, but before you all dogpile into the comments with your pet theories, let me explain what I think happened from the person who was there. This was a perfectly secure grip in the three-jaw chuck for what I was trying to do, which is a very light-facing cut. What I didn't account for is that this firebox is still soft from when the boiler was silver-soldered previously. The boiler was heated up to a red heat multiple times and that anneals the copper and so it was basically butter soft and that's what I didn't account for. So as soon as the cutter engaged, it just deformed and ripped itself right off the chuck. If this copper had been work hardened, such as it comes straight from the factory, this setup would have worked just fine. In case it's not obvious how out of round this is, here's the mandrel I used to turn these boiler shells and uh, yeah, it doesn't even begin to start to think about forming a committee to go in there. Now I really don't want to make this thing again, so I'm going to try to save it. I'll start by kind of getting it close to round in the vise by squishing it gently and strategically. If I can get it fairly close, then I can use the next technique, which is something that a viewer suggested when I was first uh, starting on this boiler project. Apparently pipe that comes from factories is frequently not round, so people that work on pipelines make these bucks and before welding up the pipe, they force the buck through the pipe to make it round. I had a piece of scrap that was close to the right diameter already, so I turned it to match the ID of the pipe, what it's supposed to be, and put a bevel on it. And now I'm going to put it in my little press here, and I'm just going to press it right on through that pipe to make it round again. I've never tried this, but it should be easy going because, again, this pipe is all very, very soft annealed copper right now. Honestly, you could do this with a small hammer, like you definitely don't need the press to do this, but the press is just a convenient way to keep it going straight. I can kind of shift it around as needed to keep it going straight down through there. And that went extremely well, I have to say. I could feel it working, as it were, and the pipe is noticeably much rounder now. I'll push it back the other way for good measure. Now, right off the bat, that is a lot better. Like, that's almost fully round there. In fact, I could probably live with that, but I can make it a little better. I put it back on the buck and I'm just going to do a little hammer forming around it. It's still soft enough that it's quite easy to just tap any high spots. You can tell when it's round because it'll spin and slide on the buck. Again, that buck is the exact nominal ID of this pipe, so if it matches the pipe, then it's correct. So I'm just working my way around with this plastic hammer finding any high spots, any sticky spots, until the whole thing slides and rotates smoothly on that buck, and then I know it's round because the buck is round. Pop that out of there and look at that, like it never happened. And as a bonus, the copper is probably now work hardened. So I still do need to face that edge. I set it up again, this time using the buck as a mandrel in the center, and I'll clamp that down in the fore jaw this time. A little better grip and a little better setup. And the copper's now hard, so this should be no trouble here at all. I'm dialing this in just to balance it, but we're just facing the edge, so it doesn't actually matter if it's perfectly dialed in. And I'm also using a different cutter here. This is uh, an insert tool for aluminum. It's got a top brake designed for aluminum, but I'm actually finding it works super well on copper. 
The books say that the proper top rake for copper is actually the same as steel, but I am finding this aluminum tool actually works really, really well. You can see the beautiful finish that it's leaving there. and it pushes over much less of a burr than the steel profile tools that I've been using previously. So a little deburring there, and that is looking very nice indeed. Very pleased with how that came out. A little bit of drama there, but we got it done in the end, as is the Blondie Hacks way. Let's set that in its eventual home, see how it looks. And that came out really nice. That edge came out great, and you can see that the roundness is really perfect now. You'd never know that uh, it was very recently completely pear-shaped. My plan to attach the firebox is to make a decorative brass ring. So I'm going to figure out how long that ring needs to be. I've got some brass stock here that I'll make it out of. So I'll mark this and cut it to length. Now, this is getting a little carried away with the fret saw here. Simple tin snips would have been fine, but you know, I get a new tool and I get excited to use it. Next, I'm going to anneal the brass to make it easy to form. This is just heating it to a dull red, easiest to do in low light, as you see here and making sure that each part of it achieves that temperature so that it's all nice and soft. And once that's done, it's very, very easy to just bend it around whatever shape you need it to be in. In this case, the boiler shell, which I'm using as a form. I cut it a little bit overly long so that I can trim it to length once I've formed it. Then it was a simple matter to scribe the exact length that I need and then cut off the excess, file those edges nice, and make sure that I've got a good meet up there. I want maybe a tiny gap, but basically those two ends to be touching. Now I'm going to silver solder the ends together. I've got some flux on there and I'll heat this up and touch some solder on there. I wasn't sure if a simple butt joint was going to work for thin sheet metal like this, but I thought I'd give it a try and spoiler alert, it actually works extremely well. So this was a pleasant surprise. If this hadn't worked, I'd have to try something, you know, more clever involving some kind of lap joint or something like that. But just a simple butt joint works just fine. Silver solder really is amazing stuff. Next, I cleaned that up, and of course, my clamping and everything kind of smushed it out of shape again, so I smushed it back onto the shell to get it back into shape. That looks good. And once again, a little bit of hammer forming around the shell just to get any poofiness out of it that it acquired when I was clamping it into that tortured shape for silver soldering. And that's looking good again. Got a really nice fit on that, so I'm pleased with that. And then I'll just clean this up a little bit. Now, the more sanding that you do, the more that joint disappears. And uh, I didn't do as much as I could have, but you can basically get that joint invisible if you spend enough time on it. And while I was at it, I cleaned up the rest of it as well. For the mounting holes on the firebox, I set it up in my vertical rotary table setup, which you've seen before on this boiler project. And I'm clamping it up with that buck once again, and I'm using the pin a parallel to the top and get it level by eye trick for finding the center line of a round thing. It's especially helpful with very large round things like this where I won't be able to get an edge finder down the sides of it. And then I used an edge finder to get the top edge so that I can position my threaded holes here. So I'm just gonna spot each one with the center drill there. And oh, I almost hit that center drill with the chuck. I saw it at the last second. I'm putting six holes in a radial pattern around this, and there's going to be 12 holes total, six in the bottom piece and six in the boiler shell, and then the band is going to have 12 holes, but they're offset because the band is not wide enough for the holes to be in line, if that makes sense. I didn't want to make the band too wide, so my thought was I'll stagger them so that I can have a skinnier band and still have six bolts on each piece holding it. After spotting, I drilled each one through the tapping size, and I'm just drilling straight into that bucket sacrificial, and I need clearance below the work for the tap. A very reasonable question would be, is it a good idea to tap these bolts directly into the copper like that? I don't normally like tapping copper because it doesn't hold threads all that well, but this piece is never going to be removed and installed repeatedly. It's going to be installed once and then left that way for life. And I have enough thickness here for this fine thread that I actually have four and a half threads in those holes. And this way I don't have fasteners inside the firebox, which might act as hot spots. So I feel pretty good about this method, but if it doesn't work out, I can always replace it with through bolts or some other method later. Next, I need to do the same with the bottom edge of the boiler shell. So I set that up in the chuck and then realized I need some support under the other end of it there. So I went and got a machinist jack 
and I'm about to make a very nasty mistake. Do you see it? Do you see what I just did? Yeah, we'll come back to this in a second. But the other end of this is supported with a simple uh, machinist jack under the end there. I'm only drilling right up against the chuck here. That's just to keep the heavy shell from sagging out of the jaws while we do this. Visually, I want one of the bolts to be centered on the front of the boiler. So I'm using a tape there to just mark roughly the center between two of the boiler bushings there. Those bushings straddle the front center line of the boiler. This doesn't really matter where these bolts land, but you know, I want it to look nice. And then did the same procedure putting these bolts in. Now, unfortunately, these bolts are staggered, as I said, so they're 30 degrees off from the first set. And on this set, two of the holes landed on chuck jaws, which was very unlucky. So I actually had to loosen the setup, rotate things 30 degrees, and then come back and finish them. Here's where I realized my mistake. I put those holes on the top edge of the boiler shell, not the bottom edge. Here's an instant replay of that mistake. No, what are you doing? When I set it down and then picked it up again, I just didn't pay attention to which end was up. So I redid those holes on the other end. They'll be covered anyway, so no harm done, but a little embarrassing. And then I had to drill the ring out, so I set that up in the same fixture, and I'm actually using the old boiler shell as a mandrel here to hold the ring. You might recognize that. That's not the current boiler. That's the old one that I scrapped while making this one. It happens to have a shell the same diameter. So I drilled the clearance holes for the bolts in the ring using that setup. And a curious thing happened. The holes actually didn't seem to line up all that well. And I'm not sure how that would have happened since I used, frankly, a very accurate setup for drilling all of these holes. I fiddled with the orientation a bit and I found a spot where four of them line up and two of them don't very well. And I couldn't really figure out why. So I actually made the ring again because making the ring turned out to be quite easy. That only took a few minutes. So I made another ring and I set that on there and I thought, well, I'll mark this out differently. So I set the height of the ring where I wanted it to be. And then I used a transfer punch to mark on some Sharpie on the inside of the ring, basically transferring the holes directly. If there was some sort of error in my setup before, this will fix that. So then I center punched and drilled out those marked holes with just a hand drill since I couldn't get a drill press or something in around the completed ring, as you can see here. And that seemed to work fairly well. After deburring those holes, then I fitted that back onto the bottom of the boiler. And this ring was even worse. This time only three of the holes lined up. Now I have two of these rings made different ways, neither of which has all six holes that line up. And I really don't know why neither of those processes worked very well, but what I ended up doing was going back to the first ring, which was better, and I opened up those holes a little bit with a file. Luckily, the ones that don't line up well are on the back, so they're not gonna be noticeable anyway, but I'm not exactly sure what happened with that setup. I feel like I did everything right, and the end result was just not good. I'll talk more about this problem in a minute, but for now I need to do the same with the firebox. So I slide the firebox into the ring there and I wanna rotate it so that the port for the gas jet is centered on the front of the boiler. So I'm just eyeballing that with a straight edge there. Again, this is just aesthetic, but I want it to all kinda of look lined up when we're done here. And then I marked that front spot on the ring and the shell. And then I taped the ring into that position so it'll hold the position relative to the firebox here. And then I take the screws out of the boiler shell. And then I can pull that assembly off carefully, maintaining the rotation and the depth of the ring relative to the firebox. And now I can come in here and make some marks. So I'm marking the top edge of the ring so I don't lose the depth of where it's supposed to land. And then I came back in here and transfer punched the threaded holes on the firebox onto the ring. This is a little different than what I did previously when I attempted to transfer punch. What I'm gonna do now is go back to this setup and I can see the back sides of the transfer punch. So I'm lining up the center drill with the back of each transfer punch because it's just sheet metal, the transfer punch pokes through and you can see it from the far side. So I proceeded to drill all the clearance holes on this part of the ring. Now let's talk about what really went wrong here. Why did I make this so difficult on myself? Well, success on a project often depends on understanding what the hard part of the project is going to be, and that's what I misjudged here. I thought making a perfectly fitting ring from flat stock with silver soldering and bending was gonna be the hard part. What's actually the hard part is getting 24 holes in a radial pattern spread across three pieces to all line up perfectly. 
that turns out to be quite difficult. If I'd understood that, what I would have done is made the ring first, installed the ring on both pieces, clamped them all together somehow, and then just through drilled the tap drill through all the pieces, and then opened up the clearance holes in the ring after the fact. That would have guaranteed alignment on everything, would have been easy. So again, success is often down to correctly judging what's going to be the hard part. Now I've got all 12 holes there on the ring staggered. Let's see how that lines up. And the good news is this approach worked very well. All six holes on the firebox lined up just fine. Mechanically here, I'm happy with the result. That's a really nice join there. Everything is probably even close to gas tight there, even though it's not necessary for it to be so. Now those stainless screws you saw were temporary. I want to make a little brass bolts for this to make it look nicer. So I'm going to take a page from the book of Mr. Crispin and I'm going to try to mass produce these with a custom form tool. So I dug through my bin of random scraps of high speed steel and I found this grooving tool which is actually just about perfect as a starting point for a small bolt mass production tool. I just needed to shave a little bit off one side of it to get the width of the profile that I need, and you'll see why here in a minute. For small high-speed steel grinding jobs like this, I find the diamond wheel on the Dremel actually works extremely well. The rate of material removal is better than you would expect, and you get really good control. So for tiny grinding jobs, give that a try. I clean up all my edges here on a stone, and I think this is ready to go. Here's how that tool works. The end of it acts as a parting blade to part off the previous bolt, and the end of it is angled towards the chuck so that the bolt head is faced cleanly on the bolt that's about to be sheared off, like so. It leaves a little nubbin on the next bolt, and then I just continue feeding, and that nubbin is faced off, and then the rest of the tool engages, and it turns down the body of the threaded section of the next bolt all in one motion. I feed into a predetermined value on the cross slide hand wheel, and I'm left with the perfect dimension for the thread. No measuring or anything required here. And then I come in with the tailstock die holder, which is already set up for the threading. And that's very easy to thread by hand because it's brass and it's a small 540 thread. And then I activate the human bar feeder and I pull the stock out to a predetermined length set by my square. And that square stays adjusted for this duration. And I just feed in again for the next one. So everything's preset, I don't have to do any measuring or any thinking at all, and I knocked out 12 of these bolts in about 10 minutes. It took, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to set all of this up and get everything dialed in for the first couple, but then you could make these bolts all day, and all of them, frankly, came out pretty close to identical. So this uh, Mr. Crispin-style technique of a cleverly designed form tool for making hardware really, really does work well. You can get more sophisticated here as well. You can add in additional angles on that tool for chamfering and rounding the ends of the thread and things like that. I started just simple with a couple of angles, and that worked out really well. And then I replaced all of my Philister head stainless screws that I used for temporary fixturing with my little brass bolts. And I'm pretty pleased with the final result. I wasn't sure how this was going to look, but I think that looks okay. There's going to be wood lagging running right up to the top of that band as well. So this is still pretty far from how the final result will be, but you'll just have to wait and see how that comes out. With the mechanicals sorted, I then took the band over to my buffing wheel and gave it a little shine. Came out pretty nice, and then I'll finish that off with some metal polish as well. After the polish, I cleaned it with acetone one more time because I want to clear coat this so that it stays shiny for the life of the boiler. For that, I'm using this brake caliper clear coat. It's a high temperature clear coat, which I've had very good luck with in the past. It takes a long time to cure. You have to give it a full week to cure, but uh, it can stand up to the heat and uh, so far it seems to keep the parts from tarnishing, so I'm a fan of it. For the firebox, I started by scuffing it up with some Scotch-Brite to give some key for paint. Probably isn't necessary because this copper is uh, fairly rough now anyway, but I did that and then cleaned it up with some acetone just to make sure we've got a nice surface for the paint. Out into the back alley now with some basic barbecue paint. This is a flat black high temperature paint. I had never used this stuff before, but actually I'm pretty pleased with it. It went on very easily and it dries surprisingly quickly. So I did two light coats with this. This is just the first coat that you see here. 
and that turned out really nice. So definitely recommend barbecue paint for boiler parts that you want to be black. Now let's get things fitted up here. So I got the ring back on there. Get all my nice little brass bolts in there. I'm pretty pleased with the finish on that ring. I'm slowly getting some techniques that I like for metal polishing. And we'll slide the firebox back in there. I didn't bother painting the inside because that's all going to get blackened over time anyway, and it's all going to be invisible to the end product. So the firebox slides in there, and luckily my holes still line up. Considering everything that went wrong with this ring, I wasn't sure that they would. Now let's flip this thing over and get a look at it. And there it is. That is one boiler firebox. I'll throw the rest of the parts that we've made so far on there so we can get a look at close to what this thing might actually start to finally look like in the end. And look at that. That is starting to look like a boiler. We have lots of fittings and lagging and other things to do yet, but the firebox turned out nice and I'm pretty pleased with that, I think. It was definitely more challenging than I expected because of my chosen order of operations, but got it done in the end and yeah, I think I'm happy with it. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this content, throw me a little love there on Patreon if you can. It's really what keeps the channel going, and I'll see you next time.